Hey guys, welcome back to the Uncommodified Podcast and to another Uncork conversation, my favorite kind of conversations because I get to uh, have a chat and uncork a drink and I'll tell you about it in a second. Today my guest is Jeff Chesbro. Jeff, thanks for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me. Uh, that's awesome. Now, let me uh, tell you a little bit about Jeff and what we're going to talk about and how I met Jeff, just so we have a little bit of introduction. So Jeff and I are going to chat about this idea tonight. We're going to talk about incubating ideas, dreams, and passions, specifically those of others, and the role of mentoring and how we can ask provocative questions to release this in other people as we work with them, which will be interesting. A little bit about Jeff and how I met him. So I met Jeff through another Jeff, a collegial <laughs> Jeff that Jeff and I know. For those of you who listen to my podcast, you know who Jeff McIntyre is. I had him on the show a long time ago. Uh, he's an awesome guy in my community, community net, uh, networker, uh, uh, weaver of people together. I don't know if it's that's his official title. He's not, not a weasel, like a weaver. It's different. <laughs> and he weaves people together and he wove us together. And he's also the community um, director of the Fuck Up Nights that I have a lot of uh, affection for in my own community. And so Jeff connected us on this grand platform called LinkedIn and connected Jeff and I and said, I think you guys should talk. We had an awesome connection uh, about a month ago, just chatted and real sense of synergies and of thinking and ideas. And I said, hey, Jeff, I think I, my audience, my listeners would love to listen to you, to you talk about what you're passionate about. And so we're going to do that. Now, Jeff, here's who Jeff, not Jeff McIntyre, but just Jeff in front of us tonight. If you're watching the YouTube channel or you're listening on the podcast and any of your favorite uh, places and platforms to do that. But Jeff is a CEO of an organization called Innovate Niagara. Now, for those of you who listen globally, let me locate that on the globe for you. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls, which you might want to be, that's what we're talking. When we say Niagara, we're talking about that Niagara Falls region, Niagara Falls, Ontario, Niagara region. That's the area of the globe that Jeff works in. And this incubator, this innovative place that he works in is a one-stop resource for entrepreneurs and high growth sectors that includes a network of business incubators, of service providers, a bunch of stuff that helps them kickstart their business and their, their dreams, and that's what we're going to talk about. Jeff served as a director on the, board, on the board of Meridian Credit Union for a number of years. He also served on the board of the CEA of the Niagara region, and he's won several business awards and achievements over his career. He's, ha he's owned his own business, a bunch of different things we'll talk about. But the, probably the biggest and most proudest achievement for Jeff on that volunteer side is an award he received with, with, J, with JC International Organization. And lots of passionate work there, and I'm sure we'll hear about that. But of course, Jeff, for me, as I told you, every great conversation usually begins with some sort of drink. That's Sometimes right. it says anemic as water, but not tonight. What are we going to drink together, my friend? We are drinking beer tonight. Awesome. What are you drinking for beer? I right? am drinking a local beer. Uh, it, of course it's, you it's are. It's called Cold Break. Yeah. Um, it's a cream ale. I had it. Uh, I had it at a golf tournament, a golf course, and it's it's a great Friday beer. I think. Awesome. Where? Do you, what? Uh, what towns it made of? In the it made of. This one is in. This one's in St. Catharines. So Saint I'm Catherine's. actually located in St. Catharines, but I don't say St. Catharines. I've always been a Niagara guy, um, because what the heck is a St. Catharines? Fair so, enough. I like that. Well, you know, and I'm drinking not a local beer to me, but another small town. Uh, it's called. This beer is called the Laura Borealis. Oh, and it's from a Laura, Laura Brewing Company, and uh, my wife's one of my favorite beers right now, and I'm liking it too. So, cheers to you, sir. Cheers to you. Now, full disclosure, this is the second time that Jeff has recorded or been uh, on the air today because he does. He he he's a host on a local radio show down in Niagara. But I bet you you don't get to drink beer with Tim Dennis. No, it, it's eight thirty-five in the morning, and uh, you, it's that's frowned upon. So. I do a, a morning roundtable every few weeks with a local, uh, I will say a local legendary uh, radio personality here that I'm lucky enough to be on the show every few weeks and uh, and chat with him as well. So I started my day on the on be, doing this and I'm ending my day doing this. So That's awesome. Good stuff. So, but again, you can't drink beer with Mike Dennis, but you can with Tim Windsor. So I think I'm already <laughs> one up on that man, even though he is legendary. <laughs> Very good. That's fair enough. Okay. So here's what we're going to crack into today, guys incubating ideas, dreams, and passions of other people and the role that mentoring plays in this and how we can provoke people to do this. So here's the question I want to start with today, Jeff. When and why did this journey start for you? Like, how did you find, did you, did you like dream one day, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't know, I'm going to own an incubator. I mean, that seems like a really strange thing, no, unless you're like no. a baby doctor. <laughs> no, I, I I grew up in a in a you know in a town that's manufacturing based. You have you you have uh, generally you know your automotive and your yep. pulp and paper, and everyone came out of school and got a job. 
um, you know, and I went to university. I, I actually am on Brock's Distinguished Alumni, one of like 50 people, and I was probably the worst student on that list. Um, <laughs> my whole brain is, I think, wired a little differently. I was raised by a teacher in a, in a town that, you know, isn't really entrepreneurs. You know, I, my family looked at me like I couldn't get a job. Uh, it was an interesting mentality because it's it's supported and celebrated now. But, you know, I, I just realized at a young age, I like to sell things and I like to figure out how things are costed. It drove my mother absolutely nuts. <laughs> and um, through actually volunteerism through that JCs, um, I was doing consulting work uh, around. I was flying all over North America doing organizational consulting and uh, one of the volunteers from the JCs I met, I spent the day doing a, a Dragon Boat Festival with him, and I came home, and I, I told my wife at the time, I said, uh, I think I just met someone I'm going to do business with. Hmm. And I was 28, maybe, 28 years old, 27, I think 27. And I became a partner in a firm with him, and I'm actually, uh, in one way or another, I'm still in business with the with that gentleman 20 years later. So. Wow. Yeah. So it so, starts with that entrepreneurial spark for you. Yeah, and trying to figure it out. And and the, my problem was, I think, with the mentorship side is I had no one to talk to. Right. So like, it wasn't like there was no one on my street that had a business. There was no one. It was so figuring it out. You know, after on, I was lucky enough to to work for a big consulting firm, and I traveled all over North America, and from small businesses to doing work for CN. So I could see how everything was wired. And, you know, some guys can put the puck in the net. And for some reason, I understood structure, process, efficiency, margins, <laughs> which are important, um, and culture. I, I think that's kind of, so it all kind of came together. When I joined my company, I was, uh, uh, it was just off the ground. I was a client of theirs and I had, uh, was building a house and was helping to have my second child. And I was like, what am I doing here? I left to start, I left to join a startup and it was the best ride of my life. I'll say one of the best rides because we have a ton of them. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was a, a period of time for five years and, and I sold that business and I'm still in business with those partners today, but it's the volunteerism and then understanding like there's no one to help. So and people are there to help. Like you just have to find them and, and those who aren't, it, it, you get more out of it, I think, than, than they do in my mind. Mm -hmm. So. So obviously this idea of these incubators is starting to become a more vogue in communities. Obviously the community I live in here in Kishwaukee, yep. we have a, you know, we have a very uh, famous incubator, Communitech, and, and Communitech does great work in the community and the Accelerator and these kind of programs. Mm -hmm. So when, when you start down your journey and you're trying to make it work and, and you don't have this mentoring role maybe in your life, that you have, when is the first time where you start to get a sense where maybe you could... Uh, help entrepreneurs distill their idea. Take, I guess, in a say, the, the, this term incubator is interesting because these ideas are sort of like precious children, little babies to these entrepreneurs. Yep. And and so when did you start first getting a sense that maybe you could help entrepreneurs get ideas out, get their dreams discovered and passions and make them practical enough they could activate them? I mean, I, I've always coached and volunteered in things. And I think coaching is a lot of that. You know, even even when I was in university, I was coaching basketball. Um, I've coached basketball and baseball my whole life. Uh, it's it's a big part of, I think, give back to the community side. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when I when I chose, you know, I, I, I the company I had before this, we were on the one, one of the 50th fast growing companies in Canada back in 2000 and I want to say six or seven. You know, I was 29. We had 25 employees. I was the second oldest person. And I didn't know what the hell we were doing, uh, and no one did. So we put together an advisory board, and I wrote job descriptions for them, pulled them together. We had great advisors. Um, we just didn't utilize them as well as we should have. You kind of look at, you know, they sat around, and they were cheerleaders when we really needed kicks in the ass uh, mm -hmm. and, and great people. But, you know, we would I, if I knew, I would have structured it different and compensated them differently and things like that. See, so there was no one that told us any of this. You know, we made massive mistakes. And it was kind of like, like no one was really there around and, and this communities were celebrating us. Um, we were in Sarnia, Ontario, we were in Detroit, we were in Toronto and we were in Niagara and, you know, we were all being celebrated, but no one was like, no one was there to help as far as, you know, what the hell are you doing guys? Like, this is a bad decision or this is, so company went great. The two, they did better. I sold in 2008 and, um, travel, I had young kids and it was just the time I, I just couldn't do it anymore. And. But as I said, my partners and I are uh, invest investors in a tech company together and it's on an advisory board. And so it's, it's, it's how process and things go. But I actually left that startup to start this organization in 2008 to help startups. So it, it sounds like a ridiculous. I left a startup to start a startup 
to help startups. And I'm like, it, it's, it was myself and a lawyer and I got there was an advisory group and I got put down board together and I got bylaws and I got an accountant and a lawyer. And, you know, that was basically like, it was a two month, let's see if I can help in Niagara because, um, you know, where I live is a beautiful place to live. And with technology, as we've seen in the last two years, you don't have to be in downtown Toronto. So I've been, I've been kind of preaching this for a while. I live 500 meters from a lake and 500 meters from vineyards where I am sitting from you today, right? So yep. that was kind of where I was like, I want to do that. I want to give back. I'll do it for two years. And that was, as I said, 2008. But it was the, it, the energy you get from helping these folks and the, and the successes and the, you know, over COVID, I've been also, a, you know, kind of a, a therapist to some of these folks and CEOs and things. It's just, you know, it's what, I think I do it because it's wish, something I wish I had and I know how, how good it is. And it's not about what you say to them. It's about listening. You know, at the end of the day, they have to own it. But like, just, it's not about you talking. And I see some mentors come in and they just want to dump and tell them everything. That's what your experience was. Like, listen, and and and, and I, as I speak, you know, for the last two minutes straight, I'm going to say, shut up, because that's what you got to do. So... Uh, and that, you know what, and that's good advice. And listen, if you're listening in today, I would encourage you to look at this conversation maybe in multiple levels. First of all, maybe you're an entrepreneur. Maybe you've got an idea that you're trying to get out and get and get some life on and you need to incubate that with yourself and others. Maybe you look at it this way. Maybe you're somebody in a community that has an idea that they you would like to start this kind of organization or this group or this this idea in your community. Maybe you don't have one. Or maybe you have nothing to do with business at all. Maybe you just have a friend who just shared with you that they've got an idea for something they want to do. It may not even be business related. And they're looking for somebody to come alongside their idea and breathe some life into it. Help them. Give give them some advice, but maybe more than more importantly, not advice. Just listen to their idea and help them get it out and get it on paper. And it could have nothing to do with business. So you can look at it this, per, this conversation for multiple angles, depending on how you want to experience it today. So with that being said, Jeff, so you obviously, one of the most valuable lessons you learned over the years that it's really about listening to the dreams and ideas and mm -hmm. others and helping them find ways to activate them. But what other things have you learned along the way that you would say, if I was going to start an incubator in my community, if I was going to become this, this, this person that, that helps people release their dreams and, and make them very practical and activate them, what other things do I have to become good at and what do I have to consider in relationship to the people I might encounter? It, it, it's interesting because you have to learn first. Although I ran a startup and I've coached and the rest of it, it's, you know, w working with companies is a little different. And for, it's structured and there's a process to it. And, and your community has been unbelievable to me over actually the last 20 years. Um, when I decided to start this and, and, and put my two feet in, um, the first call I made was I got a, a meeting with the former CEO of Communitech and the chief strategy officer. And funny enough, I mean, you know, I had a Zoom call with them both last week, 20 years, you know, whatever it is, 2008 on. And I went to them, how do you do this? And how, and you know what, they helped. They helped all the time so because it's, you know, we're not competing within the province that we live in. If we are, we're all in trouble. You're moving a job around doesn't help anyone. So the, the national and the provincial you know, cooperation we have in the tech industry is unbelievable. And when you see that, you know, we're helping companies, not just in our backyard. If I need a resource out of, out of the, your, your area, we call and, you know, that's, I'm, I'm doing a project now with six innovation centers that, you know, we're helping them. our, our organization itself is doling out $600,000 in, in the next month to startups for, for projects. And, you know, we've learned that because we've learned from others. So it's, it's kind of, you're getting mentored on well, how to mentor. And when you're listening, what clients need, you know, that's the thing is not saying, okay, you got to go through this prescriptive. This is where you are at. It's what do you need? So, cause everyone has a different experience. Some don't know how to raise money. I didn't, I do now, but I never did before. Some need to know how to build culture. Some need to, how to know how to be a leader. Some need to know that they're not the leader. So it's also telling people like, here's what's in front of you that you, you got to face. Um, so anyways, it's, it's, I wasn't on this trek that I woke up one day and said, I want to help the future generation of entrepreneurs. It just kind of happened that way. And I'm, I, I love it. That's awesome. So, so being a great listener, obviously understanding how to network and network people, how to connect them, yeah. I guess, a la, a la, a la, a la Jeff McIntyre. Yes, you got it. A la Mr. McIntyre, who is this tremendous connector of people. So, so having an acumen and a gift and understanding that people need, people need people, people need a mm -hmm. network of people. 
I guess like it takes a community to, to raise a child, it takes a community to raise up uh, an entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit within the community. So listening great, creating networks uh, and connectivity. Um, what's what, what are the number one things that you've seen that cause people to fail early in their endeavors? What, what, what causes them to stumble early on that you've learned over the years that you might want to help me avoid if you were helping me? You know, the first thing I always look at with clients is, is, is simple things, two things. We have a, I, it's, a, it's a business model canvas. Let's get your idea down one page for me and let's talk through it. And I'm going to play devil's advocate. Number two is let's look at the markets. And when you do market intelligence services, where let's look at what the data says. Because I'm a data, I look at data. If, if you said that this market's going to do A, B, and C, if you're going to come in and tell me you're building the next VCR, you can have all the passion in the world, and maybe you do, but it's not viable. And, and so I think the first thing is, is seeing, you know, it sounds like an odd thing, but is it, it's like in sports, are they coachable? You know, does someone want to listen? If someone doesn't want to listen and they're going through the tick boxes, then I can't help you to begin with. Um, but for me, it's the connecting and listening. Like, that's the first thing I think of is, what are the connections can I help once there's something there? And, you know, that's to, to the, how we got connected. He's a great connector. Jeff is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like to think I've played that role in, in, in my community for a long time as well. To the, to the point, I jokingly with uh, registered domains a few years ago, do you know a.com and do you know a.ca? Because <laughs> I get people calling me every day when they don't know what box it fits in. Can you help me with what box this goes or someone that do you know this person? And, and, you know, navigating that and understanding when the right time is to introduce that person and when they're the right person to introduce them to. It's really, you know, we I've seen great entrepreneurs that failed because they just, they might make it six months, but once they make it to six months, they, they think they already know. And it's, it's that humble, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my forties and I don't know anything yet. Okay, so so there is one of the things on the opposite side of that. If there is not a humility to learn, it is obviously going to be a stalemate. It's not going to work. It's mm-hmm. interesting because I always I have um, two adult children. I have a daughter who's uh, turning thirty four and a son who will turn thirty this year. And I've often said to them in their careers, I've often reminded them they're very bright. Uh, adults. They're smart people. They're excellent at what they do. They've been very successful. But I often remind them because, you know, I'm in my late 50s now. I say, you know, the one thing you never, you have to never forget is you always know everything you know, but you don't know everything. <laughs> That's right. And that'll always be true regardless of your age. But as soon as you forget that, yep. there's a subset of other problems that will creep into your life experience. Yeah. And, and it has to, you know, you, Asking questions is kind of like, I have a board, I, I'm a certified charter director uh, yeah. at a Mac for board, like for board governance. So my bo- goal on those boards are my, my job is to ask questions. Right. So my, my job is to listen and ask questions in my day. And my job on board of directors is to do the same thing. It's that it's, you know, and you have to, if you're good at it, you have to be able to listen, understand where they actually need the most help and help them prioritize it at the same point um, and connect them. It's, it's that fact that questions are a good thing and, and it's how you ask them. I always say to folks when I first start meeting them, like, I'm here as devil's advocate. I'm not blasting your idea, but you answer me these things. So I had, I had a call with a great potential startup last week and um, he avoided a question on his, on his burn rate three times for me. And I finally just said to him, you're going to run out of money, aren't you? And he just kind of sat there because I, he kept avoiding the question. I'm like, I'm not asking, but I'm asking, that's your real problem. The reason we need to talk today is to solve that problem first. Or you're not going to be talking to me tomorrow. And it's like, you have to be able to have that humility to say like, oh, yeah, I'm stuck here. Like I can't, I mean, during COVID, I'm, I'm, one of the things was I was doing was talking to CEOs in the morning because if they weren't getting out of their bed, their team wasn't getting out of bed right. and motivating folks and trying to just to listen and saying, yeah, like we're all having the same problems here. The drive's not there and the motivation's not there. I wasn't looking to fix anything. I was just there to listen. Yeah. A good point. Hey, listen again, if you're listening in, I think what Jeff said is really interesting and it makes me think so. Think in your life right now, what question are you avoiding? I, and again, that could be a life question, a business question, anything. but what question are, are you asking yourself that you're not answering? What question is someone else that you respect asking you that you're not answering? I don't know, in, in a sort of ethereal way, what question is the universe asking these days of you that you're not answering? Maybe that's an indicative of something. So yeah, it's a very interesting way to look at it. It's not just the questions that people answer, 
but the ones that they skirt and fail to answer that we have to come back three or four times, that might be the crux of the, the very problem they need to solve. That's an interesting way of looking at it, Jeff. Yeah, and I think it's it's understanding you're asking being genuine. You're not asking right. about to beat someone. You're asking them because you're like, if you want my help, like I'm, I'm trying to li- I'm trying to help you here. And and those are hard when you're facing things that you don't want to face. You know, they are hard. What we what do we do with the things we don't want to deal with? It's natural we procrastinate. We try to box them out. We don't want to deal with them. You know, when I we were running my old startup, every two weeks is payroll. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, we went from eight employees. I went down to five employees and we got up to 25 and then subcontract. Like we were all in our 20s. Um, and, you know, we had to face every two weeks. We had to make payroll. Right. So there's things that you don't want to you, you don't want to think about. But if you don't think about them, you're going to be done. Yeah. Yeah. So mentoring for you, when you think of this word. So if, if I'm sort of tucking into the way you're approaching this, mentoring isn't just being an advice giver. That is clearly not what you see mentoring as. It is really more of being that provocateur and asking crafty questions that get people to really think uh, multiple angles about things that maybe they're, they, they're falling in love with and now they can't ask themselves the right questions anymore. Is that fair to say? I think that's really fair to say. You know, I mean, there's there's a two kind of sides. Like, like when someone calls you and says, do you know a lawyer? Well, I can provide you that advice and a good guy to help you here. Yeah. But it's the, the business organizational culture structure, you know, the ones that don't have a yes or no box. Um, those are the ones that you're just, I'm just, I'm digging. I always tell people, I'm just asking because I'm trying to understand. Because, you know, maybe I can help, maybe I can't help. I may not even be the fit. And that's the other thing is, you can't mentor everybody. I mean, you're just not a fit for everyone. I've got I've got some mentors on our team that are strong like bull, and I know there's some companies that that will not go well with. So right. it's also understanding how, you know, I like it sounds odd to say, but you know, my I try to understand how people think and how they act, and I watch and I observe, and you can kind of tell when something's not not going to fly, yeah. um, and and they're not going to open up. So it doesn't matter how you know, and some people need that more couple extra pokes like the gentleman did the other day. Um, and sometimes the other folks need to know when just not to poke because it's, yeah. there's maybe a reason, right? Yeah. What, what kind other than skirting questions, what kind of, what other things um, suggest to you that people are not ready, even though they might be asking for help, that they're not ready for help? What, what else would indicate to you maybe that, I don't know, this is probably, we should probably shake hands and go our separate ways. Probably isn't going to work out so well. I'd say passion. Like okay. that's the, that like you, you can tell when someone is in and there's good and bad passion. You can okay. have bad, you can have passion for a bad idea and it sounds like yeah. an awful line, but people do not being like, they don't like being told they have ugly babies and yeah. these jaw jo- these things are their babies. They, they it's, I've dumped a hundred grand in this and it's like, I'm sorry. Like that's like, stop now then like you're going to do 120. Um, but yeah, when they come in with passion, cause it's, it's, it's the energy that drives everything. And especially for those solopreneurs, like they're on their own, they're doing it on their own, they got no one to bounce it off. If they don't have passion for what they're doing and they're just trying to figure out how to do it, it's not there. You can't be you can't be half in. So I can't really help, you know, I get excited by those folks. If you get me excited, I'm in. Like I'm yeah. you got me, right? You you you, you, you I, I'm I'm in. I, I believe in it and I believe in you. And maybe the idea is okay, not great, but it's also a process of understanding that. What we're doing now is a transferable skill. If mm-hmm. this does not work, next time, if you go through the same process, next time, you're right, you, like everyone, we have this thing in Canada that, that really bothers me, and that's the fear of failure. Yeah. And, and, I deal, and I tell entrepreneurs all the day, I tell, especially software ones, I tell two stories of where I was massively out wrong, where we got completely wrong. And one was two partners in a 20, uh, a 20 year business. Uh, I helped them with a tech project. We all took things for granted. And why? Because we stopped asking questions. Mm. And, and, but I tried to, you know, when you said the fuck up nights, that was actually the last event I was going before COVID. It was the Thursday night and oh. I was supposed to head up there to it. And I, and I loved the idea. We actually were in the process of licensing it in my region to do the same fuck up nights. Yeah. Um, because I'm like, this is brilliant. When you can have someone humble, stand up and say, this is exactly how I screwed up. Yep. You know, my, my old company, my two business partners and I, we lost 150 grand one year. And I remember looking at each other and going, that was more expensive than our education. And we we're like, how about we don't do that again? We're like, okay. And it was that, you know, 
facing, you know, just facing that wall to say, here's yeah. what we're never going to let happen again. Cause we didn't face things and we didn't ask questions. We should have. Absolutely. And, and to that very end, I would just say, and I'll give a plug for, for some, I, I just recorded a podcast that came out of the t- recent time I spoke at the fuck up nights here. Uh, by the time you, this episode uh, goes live that you and I are recording now, I imagine the other one will be released. And I called it the F side, the F side of my album, like the B side, but this is the fuck, <laughs> this is the fuck up side. Yeah. And at that night, I shared six or seven significant failures and fuck ups in my own life to the point where, and I share in that, that by the time I had gone through some business endeavors that didn't work very well, I was on the edge of personal bankruptcy and ruin by the age I was 27. And, um, you know, I, I've crawled my way back from that place, but you know, no one's going to see that stuff on my LinkedIn profile. Let's just be honest. Absolutely. And that's the problem, right? Is that, is that, so these entrepreneurs and people, and particularly if they haven't had a lot of life experience, they look at everybody and they look at their, you know, their, their LinkedIn dating profile, right? You know, and everybody's really beautiful, skinny and sexy, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm an overweight, uh, o- overaged uh, white guy. And so am I, so in business, I've got some ugly side of my business story, but you're not going to read that on LinkedIn. And yeah. that's a problem, isn't yep. it? You know what? It, it's, uh, we're, where I live is very close to, I can be over in the U S in like 15 minutes. I'm, really? I'm a half hour from Buffalo and I believe in cross border tech. So we've been doing a lot of work back and forth. Um, Buffalo has a unicorn. Uh, a company called ACB Auctions. Uh, it went public last year and it was worth like three point four billion. Uh, uh, one of the founders did a did a speech called uh, found, uh, "Growing a Tree in a Desert" uh, at an event. He was a keynote for us. Uh, I don't know, probably five years ago. I've I've lost all time with COVID, but he did that. He said, "Why well, I'm going to grow my company in Buffalo? Why I'm going to do this?" And they did. They got a thousand employees in Buffalo. I think they're at fifteen hundred. He's actually left the company uh, as of June, which is kind of an odd thing as a co-founder, but. You know, we were at an event with him and he said, oh, I went to the hospital the other night. And I said, well, what happened? You okay? And I thought I was having a heart attack. And he said, and I had seen, I was there to see him Kino earlier. He, we had gone over and he said, I thought I had a heart attack. And I said, well, what happened? He said, I, I anxiety. And he said, I couldn't get out of bed. And he said, it's, everyone thought it was like supposed to be easy now. He said, it was easy when there was like eight of us in a garage. Right. And the other founder was there and the same thing had happened to him. And I said to him, you got to tell people. Like that should be part of your speech. Like you got to tell people like everyone looks now. It's like when I would walk in his office and say his name, everyone's like, oh, that guy. And I'm like, but the pressure on, you know, if you don't yeah. share that, everyone looks at you like, you know, you look at your LinkedIn profile, you look like the teeth goes ching. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, yeah. and that's not the truth. So these, mm-hmm. the sharing of the, the fuck up nights and the mentorship, you know, the humility of being a mentor and saying, yeah, like I'm not perfect. I've screwed up, but don't do what I did. That's the whole yeah. goal, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I have to admit, I don't know a lot about this space the, you know, community tech, uh, innovate Niagara, this incubator sort of yeah. space. So uh, explain to me a couple of things. When, when, if I was a young entrepreneur coming to you, am I paying for your service? Am I, am I, is there grants available for your service? Um, am I ultimately paying? Are you getting a take? Are you getting a stake in my business? Like, how does this model work, Jeff? So in the province, we have 17 centers in Ontario, and, and I'm part of a network of 27. Our, we all operate as not-for-profits. And it's interesting because I've been all over uh, uh, the Valley. I've been all over New York. And in the States, they're private, but they're state-funded usually. So it's a really weird model that they're private organizations state-funded to do this. In Canada, we've chosen to invest in them. And a lot of the the partners and uh, sponsors and large companies have helped invest in this as well. But so part of part of our services for entrepreneurs, they don't have to be in the incubation space. We can just have clients come in and assist them. And our advisory is 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 a mix of uh, provincial funding, local funding, sponsor partnership funding, a, a mishmash. But for the entrepreneurs, there's no fees. Even our market intelligence, we look and dive into. We've got um, agreements where we can actually provide up some 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 of the reports are about fifty thousand bucks. But it's helping the real data from Forrester, Gardner, IBIS, all the rest of it to, to understand if your idea is good. The incubation portion is a bit different. We actually, um, our incubator, you have to apply and we have an advisory of uh, past tenants, current tenants, etc. You have to pitch to get in. Um, and you also have to pay. You pay, right? So there's two different, you know, sides of it. The reason we do that is because it's, there's not, we want the value to be this, this, you know, 
people being in the space is the value because you want to have those peer discussions. Yeah. And if it's just somebody who can pay the rent, that's not what we're looking for. So yeah. it's funny over COVID, you know, we've added companies, people aren't coming in, but they've still maintained our rent role because, you know, it's the most bizarre concept. Our board of directors just shakes their head. Like this is kind of odd that people have paid the entire time and are not coming in because, you know, that's, they want to work hybrid, but they still want a landing space where they can bring their team in because of the culture. You know, we're all dealing with how do you, how do you build a culture in the space? So it's, it's a kind of a hybrid model. You know, we do fee, some fee for service work, et cetera, but you know, we, we along right now, along with, with their six uh, provincial centers across from Windsor through to Halton, ourselves, Hamilton, Guelph, et cetera. And we, we, we came together to, to get some funding from the feds where we're able to provide um, $30,000 in matching funding for 20 projects at each center. And this is C capital for those ones that just need that extra push in grant. So sometimes there's grant money, but that's not what we're trying to teach you. It's, you know, we all see the dragons dead in the shark tanks. And I have to be honest with you, the great entertainment, terrible, terrible thing to see as an entrepreneur to say, because it's not, that's not what happens. No one's giving you these valuations, especially with inflation in the tech space. People right. don't get that. And um, it's a show. Your ideas and it's, it's not the way money is, is invested. That's kind of, it's an interesting. And we've had, I've got tenants that have successfully had deals on Shark Tank and, or uh, Dragon's Den, my fault, my apologies. But by the time mm. the due diligence goes, the valuations change. It's, it's a show. It's great entertainment, but it's a show. Mm. Um, so, you know, we try to help in those ways, connecting, et cetera. But as far as incubation, when you're there and you can have that five minute conversation with a co-founder or a peer, or, you know, even, even some of the team members can bond and say, oh, what's your problem today? You know, we had uh, uh, a company recently join us uh, through a startup visa program. So they came to us from India and moved his company over and he's involved in the restaurant um, POS systems uh, in, in large, in large chains too. It's not like he's doing well, but, you know, he wants to get into door delivery stuff uh, through some of the apps. And he met this co-founder and, uh, of another company. We said, okay, what do each of you do? And in five minutes, both of them, one guy said, well, you need to get into DoorDash probably. I know the VP partnership. So I went to university and I had lunch with him. Do you want me to introduce you? He said, I haven't been able to get in. Boom. It's like he looked at us and said, the value of the space has paid for itself already. Because right. it's that kind of, you know, it doesn't have to be us who are helping. you got a yeah. peer group around you that when you're, Maybe slam in the door a little. Someone knows why you're slamming the door. Yeah, yeah. So it's that connection. It's that networking. And it's interesting because I think back, I mean, before any of this was, was true, these incubator spaces and these things, and I was in the tech thing, but in my early 20s, I started a marketing business. I knew nothing about marketing. <laughs> but I was a recipient. Actually, it was in my before I turned 20 because I received a youth, what was called a youth venture capital loan at the time. Mm -hmm. I received $20,000 uh, at, uh, at, no, at, at a low interest rate. The time when interest rates were very high when I was uh, 18. That's almost uh, 40 years ago, so a long time ago. And um, I was able to start my first business with that. Now, it ultimately failed. That's true. But that investment has paid dividends, I'm sure, over multiple times for the government at the time who provided that to me, yeah. a local, local business community and part of the, 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 the business development bank probably at that time in Canada. So I've been the recipient of that. And even more important than money, I have been the recipient of great mentorship over the years. People who have chosen to invest in me, um, ask me those difficult questions, provoke me to my own thinking, ask me to look at my own baby in the mirror and mm -hmm. recognize it really was a little ugly and, yeah. needed, and, and needed some things. And those are really hard, vulnerable things, particularly as people come and submit their ideas, which you said are like their children to you, and the care and concern that you apply in that process. So again, if you're listening in, Think about what this means to you in your world, whether you're in the business community or not. If you're in this space, you know, um, think of the privilege you have as you walk beside people and you help unpack things and you connect them and you and you bring them into the space where their dreams can become reality. I mean, this is a really, I mean, in some ways it's sort of a, sounds like a safe, strange word, but it's a, it's a bit of a sacred privilege to help somebody take an idea, bring it to life. Not just, of course, to monetize it, which is important. If we don't make money, we're not going to be sustainable. But there's a lot of other stuff going on under the way. So, so let me ask you for your best question. If I, if you, if I was going to work with somebody who wanted to get their idea out and figure it out, um, what's the best question? What, what are one or two of the best questions that I ought to ask them? I think the background of why they're, you know, what, why I always like to know why how they got there. 
Like, why are, why are you here right now? Like, what, what, what are you in front? What are your top needs? Because I like to hear what their top needs are, what they think their top needs are. Because they said, the one yeah. gentleman didn't, it was, it was cash. He didn't, right. it, it did nothing really mattered until that happened. So I think it's lower, you know, I like flow. I don't have a checklist. I don't sit down and, you know, ask these 10 questions or anything. Just to, but finding out what their background, why they're there, what their hunger is, you know, because um, mm. hustle is a very important thing to me. Yeah. Um, I always, I always, I, I got it, you know, talk about getting it wrong. I, I, I got something very wrong. I always used to think hustle wasn't talent. I used mm. to say hustle is not talent. I'd say it to my children. I'd say it to anyone. Cause I, I'm a hustler. I'm not smarter than anyone. I'm not, I got a hustle cause I'm not smarter. And I read a quote by Bill Russell like two years ago. And, and his line was Bill Russell is one of the greatest basketball players for all, all time. For those listening who don't know, mm. like one of the top players ever, uh, one of a million championships, uh, and he said, hustle is a talent because if it wasn't, everyone would have it. Hmm. And I thought, oh, I got to stop saying that because I'm wrong because it is. And you watch like those who don't have that hustle, those that don't have that passion, it's going to be tough to help. But, hmm. you know, it's not shutting someone off to say you have a terrible idea because to your point, Tim, you, you, your idea might have been half baked. It might have done something, it might have not. But people saw something in you that like, yeah. if this doesn't work, he's got the hustle. He's yeah. he's coachable. He wants to do this. He wants to learn. And once you have that, people are willing to invest back in you. You know, I, I I'm fortunate enough. I've I've tagged on you know a pile of people that are are mentors to myself. That I'm not sure why someone even talked to me. I'm like, why are you talking to me? You know, yeah. I. I, I I remember back in the day when I did consulting work, there's a, a company that's been around, I would say now it's probably like 155 years called GT French Paper. And they've got uh, area uh, distribution and all, all, a very large company. And I, mm-hmm. I used to get to do consulting work and the one Friday I, I ended my day and I spent an extra hour with the president and I chatted with him and talked and picked his brain. I went home and my wife time said, you know, how was your day? And I said, I got paid to understand their process, try to help them and then spend an hour with the president of this company and they paid me. So it's like, you know, people want to give back. He wanted to tell me, he wanted to help. And, um, but I also listen, right. And it's also don't, doesn't, if you don't take my advice, I do not take it personally because I do not have a scope into your business. I do not know, you know, I don't know. I don't know everything that's going on. You're telling me the information you want to tell me, first of all, because you're not telling me everything. And second of all, I'm not every, I'm not there every day. Something could, you know, something could change tomorrow that I don't know. I don't know about today. The thing that I always say to a company when I deal with them is I'm on your speed. I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So if you want to hold yourself accountable to keep like milestones, fine. But you know, a lot of these folks, you know, are starting it off the side of their desk, right? They have to feed themselves. They have to work still. They have family, they have other things. So I always right away say, listen, if I don't hear back from you three weeks, don't think I'm like, Oh, I got to get back to Jeff. I, it's all forward your stuff. I'm here when you need it. And it's kind of making that, that process that we're on something together. We all do these at different investments. We all have different money. We all have different things outside of here, but I'm here for you when you need me. And, and I think yeah. building that reassurance is kind of like deep, take a breath. Right. Yep. No, that's good. That's great advice. And again, if you're listening in, figure out how you can apply that in your world and what it makes, what makes sense to you. So listen, let's bring this conversation in for landing. There's two questions I always like to wrap up in these, these, these conversations that I have, these uncorked conversations. So one is, you know, my podcast is built around this idea of uncommodified. I'm my t-shirt says it. So of course it has to be, it's on my t-shirt. So and this idea has been percolating for me for the for a long, long time about how do we take things that are commodities. With, at the end of the day, most things are commodities because it just means readily or easily accessible in multiple places. And by that definition, a lot of things, most things are commodities, including ideas and ideologies. Um, and that unfactor is that unique thing we bring to the table. So when, 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 when Jeff, not McIntyre, <laughs> but, but, but Chesbro, yeah. is bringing the, the Jeff – in a room and in bringing something no one else can bring because this is Jeff inherently, this is your uncommodifying factor in the room. What's, what are you doing that you know is, is, is a little different, subtly different, or maybe substantially different in that room? Wow. I don't know if I have that. I honestly oh, I, don't. I think you do. I Well, I don't, I don't know if I do. I, I have, you know, I, I think, I think the one thing is, is um, I wear my heart on my sleeve. That's one thing. If you tell people that, you know, you know when I'm happy, you know when I'm not. Um, but I also, you're not going to get bullshit from me. So uh-huh. I, I think there's kind of that factor that if you're going to ask me a question, um, don't, I, I, 
you asked me, like, you know what I mean? I, um, so I, I, maybe that's a factor. I think part of it is, is I'm good at connecting. Like I, I, I want to be Jeff McIntyre one day, I guess. Um, <laughs> but I'm someone who likes to connect people. I get a, I get a, I get a drive out of that and a kick out of that. And, you know, we're social beings. I volunteer a lot in the community. I've coached, obviously, you know, COVID is, is, has changed how we do things, but I don't know if I have that. I don't know if I have that. Well, thing. I think from what you said, I think I would say you do. One is you do have, I, I believe you have a unique ability to connect people because of what you do. And, you know, I've done a little bit of research into you since we first met. So <laughs> oh, I, ha I, I have a recognition that I believe <laughs> you, you have a secret power that maybe you don't always know about. You do have that secret power to connect. But in addition, I do believe that it is uncommodifying to be the truth teller. Unfortunately, sometimes, particularly, I think, when we're talking to people about their dreams, we, we want to be so sometimes, you know, so so sort of, um, you know, uh, 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 non-offensive to people because we don't want to really tell them ah, that's an ugly baby. Yeah. Like, I hate to tell you, but first, it's an ugly baby. And second of all, it's got a shitty diaper. Um, that truth is transformative. And there's sometimes, as you know, sometimes people tell people what they want to hear or they think they told them what they should have heard, mm -hmm. but they didn't do it in a way that it could really be heard. And I think that is a gift in and of itself. So. Uh, being a truth teller and not bullshitting people through things, I actually think that is an uncommodifying behavior in my book because a lot of the worlds I live in, I think a lot of the room is full of people who aren't able to come to grips with the real reality and they're not always as honest as they need to be with themselves and others. Yeah, I I, I think, yeah, that's part, I do think that's part of it and also not, I think it's not also... Um, you know, I, I, I have no problem putting out my hand and saying the emperor has no clothes. I honestly don't. Yeah. I never have. I've been that way since I was a kid. It's driven my mother nuts. It's probably driven my ex-wife nuts. It's probably driven some of my former partners nuts. But it's it's that, like, being that person to say, I don't, oh, yeah, my bad. I understand. Yeah, I screwed that up. But the next time when yeah. you see those nods, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, they just were scared to ask the question. It's kind of like, so truth telling is one thing, but also being, you know, opening it up saying, I don't know. And maybe I'm, right. am I dumb here? To, oh, and then are you find out, well, everyone was missing page yeah. 10 of the report and no one would say anything about it. Right. Yeah. So telling, yeah. telling the truth in different ways and just not being, you know, not being right. afraid to look like a fool. Well, and I think that that's, that's a really good idea. Cause I think sometimes if you're not willing to look foolish, the reality is, is that you will never find that line. Cause there's always, there's that fine line between being an absolutely brilliant uh, person and a little bit on the crazy, you're not quite sure where you are. So there's a, there's a line. There. <laughs> fine so, balance, eh? Yeah, there's a fine balance. Uh, yeah. So la last question. So if you ha could give one piece of advice and I'm going to, I want to carve this two different ways. Okay. If you could give one piece of advice and one encouragement to two different constituents, I'd like you to do this. So first of all, a piece of advice and one encouragement to somebody who wants to help people incubate their ideas and, and, and be, and do the kind of work you do. And secondly, a piece of advice to somebody who's got an idea that they're trying to get out, that they want some help with two, two different constituents. Okay. Let's start with the, I want to be like Jeff. I want to be like Communitech. I want to be like in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, innovate Niagara. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's your encouragement to me? If I want to, if I want to do this kind of stuff for people. Um, I think from the mentor standpoint, I, I, listening, obviously, number one, but number two is just because that's your experience does not mean that's their experience. Uh -huh. So just because it happened to you in that manner does not mean it's going to happen to them in that manner. And times are different. It's understanding like, you know, I, there's certain circumstances, your experience doesn't mean anything. It's, it's cause that, you know, time is different. Uh, things have passed. So it's kind yeah. of like, you know, Back in my day, no, who no yeah. one cares back in your day, but it's not your day anymore. It might be your day, but times are different. So okay. understanding that, yes, I've been through those trials and tribulations and how do they apply to this person now is great. But just because it happened to you doesn't mean it's going to happen to them. Like mm -hmm. I've seen this before 10 times. Yeah. That's, that's good wisdom. Yeah, now so. on the other side, um, I've got a baby and I think it's beautiful yeah. and I believe it's a mil it's a billion dollar baby, my friend. Yeah. Uh, what's your best piece of advice for me? Uh, you better have passion for it. Um, if not, it's not a billion dollars and you better be humble because you're going to have days that you do not want to get out of bed and you need mm -hmm. to find those people around you with, cause especially I've always been in partnerships. So I'm not someone who's been in business just so you know, every time I'm in it, I've had somebody It's like, I've run this company now, but I have a strong peer group and advisor stuff. But, um, 
well, I was able to start it back then, but I ha I, I'm not by myself. And those folks that are by themselves is a whole different thing. Yeah. But, um, you know, you, you, when you're by yourself, it's one thing to get out of bed. When you're with partners, you're married to those people. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you have that, find those good people around you. Um, and, and people will help. So if you have that idea, do it at your pace. Don't be afraid to fail. That's the, like the number one thing is like, you might have a billion dollar idea that in execution completely falls down. I was an investor in a, in a company that raised $80 million. I helped them as an advisor, raise their first 10.4 million. I was an investor in it. Great idea. It wasn't the, it wasn't the tech that felt, it was everything around it that fell. So, you know, just because you, you think it's all going to go, it, it's not. And, and whether you think you never made it, I mean, like, that's basically what I can tell you is like, once you think you've made it, you're in trouble. Hmm. That's good advice. Going back to something you said earlier about the advice that you would give to people who are, are wanting to mentor or wanting to encourage people. Uh, I often, the terms that I uh, came to mind when you were talked about is, I often think a lot of times, because, you know, I have a business now, today and I'm, I'm a consultant and coach and a lot of different things. And I often remind myself that, Tim, your experience is is descriptive, not prescriptive. Huh. There's a big difference. So yeah. my, my experience describes something to myself and others, but it doesn't prescribe the antidote to their situation like some kind of prescriptive medication. Yeah, and that's, that's the fine line too, right? Because you have to... You're you're wanting to help and improve, but at the same right. point, you have a bias, and you do have a right. natural bias. You just can't, you're gonna have a bias. Just we, don't yeah. forget you have one. Hundred percent. We we listen. We got cognitive biases, and they hang on us, and we never see them. So listen, brilliant conversation today, Jeff. Really appreciate it. So listen, if somebody wanted to hunt you down to uh, to pick your brain or to learn, or if they're in Niagara, if they're somewhere else, and they want to connect with this community, how do they get a hold of you? Uh, best way is LinkedIn. Jeff Chesbro will probably find me. I'm on Twitter as well. Uh, at my name is, if you can spell it, you can find me. Uh, I guess that's uh, that's the first thing. It's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me is through those two networks, either Twitter or LinkedIn, at Jeff Chesbro or Jeff Chesbro on LinkedIn. Shoot me a message. Um, it's, it's funny because you never know how these things are going to turn out, right? Like the keynote that I told you about, the gentleman who has the, the co-founder of the $3.4 billion uh, company, he opened his speech with, we met on Twitter and the room laughed, right? Because I met him. We, we were, he was running incubator in the States. I'm doing one here. Hey, we're 30 minutes away. What can we do together? And yeah. we reached each other, DM'd each other on Twitter. And within a week, you know, we're having a beer and yeah. it, it, so cheers to beer Cheers to beer. Um, and, but it's, you never know what connections you're going to make and who's going to be able to help or send you to someone that help. I, I, there's so many times I have to talk to someone like, Oh, I'm working with this person. We've been doing this, this. And I'm like, yeah, I know I introduced you. And so as a mentor, or as a, do you know, you got to let that go that you get offended by that. But it's kind of funny when you're back, just so you know, I put you together. Right. It's, yeah. And that to me, I don't care if they know or not. It makes no. me feel good that outcomes are positive. Yeah, be 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 an, be an, be a, be an introducer. And listen, if you if you listen to this podcast and you haven't listened to a podcast that will be a few podcasts before in rotation, I've been doing a series called Unenders. And um, just prior to this show airing, you'll see in the in the uh, repository of podcasts, you're going to see a podcast called Unenders or Weavers. And one of the things I talk about is how. Uh, unenders weave people together and connect their connectors. They weave the tapestry of people's experiences together for the sake of weaving something bigger, some grander sense of who we are in connectivity. If you haven't listened to that podcast, I encourage you to do so because I would suggest that Jeff McIntyre is a weaver. I think uh, Jeff Chesbro is a weaver. I think all of these people who operate in this space, they're, space, they're weavers. So listen, guys, thanks for giving us a gift of your time. Thanks for listening in. Do me a favor, connect with me on social media or email me at tim at theuncommodified.com and let Jeff and I know how you're uncorking this idea, these ideas into your world for the benefit of yourself and others. Thanks and have a great day. 